Okay, good uh, afternoon, everyone, and welcome back uh, to the afternoon session. In this session, we're gonna have uh, two talks, and it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, first speaker, Professor Ram C. Chaudhry, who comes from the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he is a distinguished professor in the Department of Materials, Chemistry and Biochemistry. He's also the director of the Materials Research Lab. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ram actually did his PhD under CNR Rao, and he has uh, a lot of honors. You know, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, Royal Society of Chemistry, and a fellow of the American uh, Association for the Adman Advancement of Science. Please, you may welcome Ram. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's uh, my great pleasure to, to, to be able to visit here and give this talk. Like many of us at this meeting, this is the first meeting that I've attended since, uh, in effect, since COVID, since, you know, the March meeting was canceled in 2020, uh, which I didn't attend, of course. Uh, so it's a special pleasure to be back here, and I'd like to thank the organizers, Tony and, uh, and the board, and of course, uh, His Highness, and also Natalie, uh, who's always been uh, so effective at putting these meetings together. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, sort of, it's a continuing theme in my group, thinking about how to advance the discovery of functional materials. And I would really want to emphasize that the right terminology to use is perhaps how, how to screen functional materials, you know, because, uh, because we are, the term discovery is sort of charged. Uh, and uh, it's actually, I think, quite uh, uh, apropos that I follow up on Tony because uh, uh, Tony is already sort of explain the parameters. So uh, this is, uh, I'm not actually going to show very much work from my current group. It's uh, some of the work I'm showing is a little bit older, but this is a picture of my current group. And uh, in this picture, you have uh, uh, Sam, who's just graduated and started a position with Microsoft uh, uh, in their Station Q, which is their quantum computing unit. Uh, and uh, Kira, and, uh, and uh, Rebecca are my most senior students, and they have all been here to Ras al Khaimah in, in different years. And uh, it's really, I'm, I'm a little saddened that, uh, you know, last year and this year we've not been able to send students here. For, for my students, it's like a highlight of their, of, their, of their PhDs. And over the past so many years, I've sent at least uh, something like 15 or 16 students over. Um, so I just want to sort of start by, uh, by, by, uh, by sort of making clear what we mean by materials discovery. You know, do we, do we, when we say we, a, a material is discovered, do we mean that it is a new structure or composition or structure and composition and form of matter serving a specific function? Or do we mean that it's a known structure composition slash form of matter where a specific function is recognized. And in the context of, of what Tony was talking about, I think this is, uh, y you will understand where I'm coming from. So uh, a great example from, from, from what you heard is, uh, is uh, the use of lithium cobalt oxide as a cathode material. It was a material that had already been prepared and studied for its magnetic properties. In fact, several years ago, uh, along with Matt Rosinski, uh, uh, we did some work on the solid solution between uh, lithium nickel oxide and nickel oxide, trying to understand the magnetic behavior there. And we actually, uh, 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 I remember very clearly, we were reading a John Goodenough paper on lithium nickel oxide from 1958. So, you know, John Goodenough ha has the advantage of having been around for a long time. Uh, so, uh, so while many of us have to go back in the literature to find compounds, he just goes, has to go back in his own history to find compounds. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so lithium cobalt oxide would be a great example of a known structure, composition, and form of matter, but when, when, when applied as a cathode material, that would be a, a, a specific function being rec recognized. Uh, but of course, you can, you can think that real materials discovery would actually be putting together elements, and this is actually, done in, in things like alloy design. Stuart over there was just showing me his nice new MacBook. I'm, I understand that the aluminum alloys that the MacBook is made from have, you know, sometimes uh, as many as 
10 components. I mean, I, these are proprietary. I don't know, know the details. But, but in the alloy design business, people actually know how to pick you know, so many components out of the periodic table and put them together to make something like that sort of meets the aesthetic qualities that Apple designers require of their aluminum, which is apparently a high challenge. Uh, I was also similarly actually stunned to learn that the new Teslas, which are being injection molded, have a very high percentage of silicon in their aluminum silicon formulation. Uh, it was really like, for me, I would never have guessed that that the alloy they used is something like 20% by mass silicon. So anyway, in alloy design, people know how to do this. You know, you can basically know how to pick uh, elements from the periodic table, say, I'm going to put them together in this composition that no one has ever done before for this particular application. You know, but it's, and of course, this is done all the time in organic chemistry. You know, uh, uh, there is Ben making little sketches of molecules, but he can go back to his lab and and say, okay, I think this molecule is going to have this particular, you know, photoresponsive properties, uh, uh, and uh, and they can make it. But in in bulk materials, in in the in the world of functional inorganic materials, we don't have this luxury. Firstly, thermodynamics dictates what forms. We can't just draw a structure and then say, I'm going to go to the lab and make it. That doesn't happen. So, mostly what we do, in fact, then is screening. Okay, at best, what we can do is. We can take a known known structure of matter and tweak the composition, you know, uh, uh, substitute one element for another. But uh, uh <clears throat> but I would not call that really uh, uh, the discovery of a new structure. So screening, I think, is a better term. So that's what that's what this talk is going to be about. This talk is also going to be about uh, you know strategies. So so uh <clears throat> how, what are the typical strategies? Well. This has changed a lot, even in even even in my relatively sort of short career in, in uh, as a solid state chemist. I can I can tell you that I started off <coughs> with Professor Rao working on on high TC superconductors, and in those days, we what we knew was the cuprates with these layered structures had high superconducting transition temperatures. So there we were trying to make vanadates and nickelates. And palladium compounds and and uh, so so forth to try and reproduce uh, high TC superconductors in other chemistries. Today we would actually know that a good starting point would be to try and find similar band structures, you know, or, uh, at least, right? So we are even even in th in the last 25 years we've come a long way. But this is still <coughs> a very popular way to 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 uh, to function as you as as you just heard lithium cobalt oxide is not not as desirable as it used to be because of the geopolitics of cobalt so we're trying to uh, replace much of the cobalt with nickel which also has has its own issues you know there's one nickel producer in russia that that produces something like 3% of the world's sulfur dioxide emissions okay because nickel is the ore is NIS, it's <coughs> and it's roasted. So it's uh, so from from sort of acid rain viewpoint, nickel is also really nasty. <coughs> so anyway, uh, uh, an analogy with functional materials, uh, uh, with known materials, you know, you have lithium cobalt oxide. Let's replace as much of the cobalt as we can, either with nickel and manganese, uh, or nickel mangan uh, or nickel and or replace the cobalt totally in making nickel manganese aluminum, uh, what is called NMA. And then, of course, they establish guidelines. If if you're trying to make a new magnet, you know that you would you would be trying to do it with D and F electrons for, because they provide the kind of uh, narrow bands that give you magnetism. Or if you want to make something that has a dipole, like a ferroelectric, you look for something that may have uh, 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 lead two plus or tin two plus or a D zero cation, like niobium five plus or titanium four plus. And similarly, if you want to make a thermoelectric, you, you, you probably are not going to naturally uh, start with, say, chlorides and oxides, because you know you want a small band gap semiconductor, and oxides are rarely small band, form small band gap semiconductors. So there are these uh, uh, guidelines. These are, I, would, I would say these are some of the more traditional strategies. There are newer strategies, and may, maybe they're not even so new. So we just talked about alloy design, but here is this paper from Jens Norskov. It, it now seems 
quite a quite a long time back, but already in 2002, they they did DFT calculations on uh, on close to 200,000 uh, possible alloys. Uh, these are L12 binary alloys uh, from uh, from these this combinations these combinations of elements shown here to to come up with what are the sort of stable. Uh, uh, binary co uh, compositions, and uh, in fact, uh, Vinayak's colleague Chris Wolverton at, at Northwestern is uh, uh, has also been uh, looking at this kind of uh, uh, area of research. And you already heard from Claudia the work that they're doing on what they call topological quantum chemistry. So uh, uh, a lot of this is now even incorporated into the materials project. So you can actually go into the materials project and s ask whether whether any of their comp the, whether the compounds are topologically tr trivial or not. And, and of course, uh, uh, this, is th this kind of work is, is extremely uh, helpful. But in, in both of these examples, uh, it's interesting to, to note that in the, in the alloy, in this uh, binary alloy example, the goal was to calculate to see whether, this, whether an alloy is stable or not. And, uh, uh, and for that, a DFT calculation does a very good job, ground state stability. And here, in, in topological materials, it's, 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 it's very beautiful that the band structure is the property. You calculate the band structure, and the band structure is the property. If you're calculating a thermoelectric, you know you have to do you know, Boltzmann transport. You have to try and figure out what the Zeebeck coefficient is going to be, what the... Uh, what the uh, electrical conductivity may be, what the thermal conductivity may be, etc. Uh, when you're calculating a topological material, the band structure is the property. It's a little bit also similar in the world of MOFs, where the structure is the property. If you know the structure, you know the porosity, for example. And if your goal is to make porous frameworks, the structure is the property. But this is often also not the case. So we are going to talk about cases where the structure or the band structure is not the property. So. So uh, efforts like the ones I just showed you, I can go back, I think. Efforts like, the, like these, you know, uh, uh, this, this effort in particular, is aided by the existence of something like the International Crystal Structure Database. And, uh, you know, for me, the, uh, the International Crystal Structure Database is an act of heroism, uh, mostly from German solid-state chemistry. You know, you have, if you go and look up, look up the database, you will see how many of those structures actually are published in journals like Zeitschrift for Anorganische uh, Chemie. Uh, and in fact, uh, by sometimes not, not a very large number of people. Hopper, for example, who's a famous German solid state chemist, has, uh, has uh, several hundreds, maybe thousands of entries. Actually, Mercury Kanatsidis has a thousand entries. I checked the other day. Uh, so he's the modern German solid state chemist. Uh, uh, so, so they generated these structures purely out of curiosity, did, did careful crystallography, then had the advantage that crystallographers are so systematic that they have actually a way of, uh, of, of documenting their data, the CIF file, right? And the CIF file is also actually came originally out of efforts of a Cambridge crystallographer called Olga Kennard, uh, and uh, who gave rise to the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center, but also the Protein Data Bank. So how do we know that, that the, co the coronavirus has a particular structure? Because you can look up the structure through the Protein Data Bank. How can we do this? It's because crystallographers have standard file formats. So this is, says something about the importance of file formats. But anyway, all of this goes into the International Crystal Structure Database, so it allows you to sort of do things. But when it comes to properties, there are not very many databases. So one of the things that my group has started doing, which, uh, which some of you may find uh, 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 interesting, some of you may just find amusing, is we actually read papers and pull the data out. Right? So this was, uh, for example, a recent effort led by my uh, graduate student, uh, uh, Nicole Schauser, who, uh, who was jointly up, uh, uh, advised by my colleague Rachel Siegelman and I. Uh, Ra Rachel Siegelman is a polymer scientist, a uh, very distinguished polymer scientist at UC Santa Barbara. And, <coughs> and uh, Nicole Schauser actually won uh, an APS, uh, the APS Polymer Prize for her, for her PhD work. And she was aided in this by Gabi Kliegler and Piper Cook, two undergraduates. 
So between them, they, they literally like went into the literature and yanked the data out manually to create an interactive database. You can actually check it out for yourself on this website, pedatamind.org. And we were trying to basically see whether there are general trends that we can extract from polymer chemistries and their lithium ion conductivity. And, uh, and it's, 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 it's not, certainly the, it's not a story of simply uh, saying, oh yeah, this is what we learned from this database and this is our next best lithium ion polymer, but certainly there are interesting things to learn from this. For example, uh, we, we had uh, data over several decades of, uh, of their activation energy, well, not several decades of the activation energy, but certainly several decades of the Arrhenius prefactor <coughs> in fitting the, uh, the uh, uh, conductivity versus uh, temperature pl uh, plots. And <coughs> this allowed us to verify what is called the meyer neldel correlation across uh, these are a whole bunch of polymers with a different uh, set of uh, uh, lithium salts doping them. So uh, this is one example, but this kind of work actually started with, uh, and I think Vinayak, you were talking about this work earlier. Uh, this actually started with some work that we did uh, initially on thermoelectric materials several years ago, and this was sort of this is sort of for us the iconic work. But my call this at that time. Uh, now at the University of Liverpool in Taylor Sparks, uh, who's faculty at, uh, at uh, the University of Utah, worked with Chris Borg, who was an undergraduate, to wade through the literature, digitize plots in the literature, and yank data out in order for us to try and establish correlations. And this is actually a very sort of, it's a, it's a meta plot, right? So this particular plot of thermoelectric materials, you see the chemistry is represented by the color, the size of the symbol is uh, an indication of the of the f uh, of the power factors of these thermoelectrics. So larger is larger means better. And what you have on the y-axis and on the x-axis is basically indicators of of the elements that go into these thermoelectric materials. So if it's if it's on the f on the top right, it means that you're making the thermoelectric from scarce or exp or expensive elements. And if it's on the bottom left, you're, health, you're in a healthier regime to make thermoelectrics from if you actually want these materials to have an impact on society. Uh, oh, and uh, interestingly, Chris Borg now works for Citrine Informatics, which is uh, a, a, a materials data science company uh, based in the Bay Area. So uh, 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 Taylor Sparks also did, did, uh, did some nice work on on battery materials, and in fact, this was at that time Jay Harada and Bethany Letia were, were undergraduates in my group, and they were also going through uh, uh, data. So, when they had amassed a bunch of data, they just combined forces with Taylor and his uh, student Leila Ghadbegi, and they wrote this nice paper uh, again with an interactive database. So, so the idea is that we need data on materials properties, which we don't have, and sometimes we have to create this data ourselves, right? So uh, the sort of extreme example of this is we are trying to do a synthesis learning project right now, and this is Piper, who was on the right, who was also involved with, uh, uh, with the polymer uh, uh, lithium-ion conductor data mining project. Uh, and uh, uh, Eve Moser on the left is a postdoc, and Eve has been interested in trying to do synthesis learning. You know, if you if you look at uh, f if you look at the way that we f we we formulate the syntheses of solids, it often appears very arbitrary. For a newcomer, you know, if you're making a compound with say manganese and germanium, uh, uh, you know you 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 have to heat manganese and germanium together. You know you can't do it in air because they would get oxidized. Both would get oxidized. How do you do this? So they're trying to. So Eve is trying to see whether, by looking at a lot of data, you can come up with uh, with some synthesis guidelines. So Eve uh, went into the ICST and found all the manganese containing intermetallics, and then she gave uh, Piper the list. So Piper actually read something like 2,000 papers to find like temperature and time conditions in each of these papers to to to. Uh, to, to make this plot. So we, this, is, this, 
is very much work in progress. You may ask, why are you doing this instead of doing, for example, natural language processing, you know, that people are text, text mining, that some people are doing. And we actually have uh, uh, another postdoc in the group who is actually uh, uh, doing text mining, but, uh, uh, but Eve didn't know about it when she set Piper to the task. But now that Piper has done this, we realize that we actually have a nice validation data set. We can take the same papers and text mine them and see whether we get similar, similar data. So this is, and this was uh, interestingly, particularly apropos for Piper to do, because she couldn't come into the lab during COVID. So you know, we could send her the papers and say, Piper, pull this data out and put in this Excel file. So uh, interesting thing to, interesting thing, way to keep your undergraduates employed. Great. So uh, with this, I'm actually going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the screening of two different classes of materials, uh, neither of which, uh, neither of, uh, in neither of which is the answer clear from, say, something like the electronic structure. And the first is materials for magnetocaloric applications. So <clears throat> a magnetocaloric is a material that you can take through a cycle of magnetization and demagnetization to make a refrigerator or to make a heat pump more accurately. So in, the, in, a, in a ferromagnet uh, or, or basically in any spin system, you can have a, a, a state where the spins are random as on top there on the left or a state where the spins are aligned. So this would be a lower entropy state on the bottom and a higher entropy state up there. Correspondingly, if you're thinking of gas compression refrigeration, this would be like an uncompressed state on top and a compressed state below, uh, a low and high entropy state. So this is the entropy temperature Carnot cycle. So uh, <coughs> you could take your magnetic material through the cycle through processes of isothermal magnetization. So magnetization where you dump the heat, for example, if this were a refrigerator, you dump the heat into the room. Uh, <coughs> you, uh, 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 and then, once you, take the mag once you take the compressed gas inside the refrigerator, you expand it, but it's adiabatic because the walls of the refrigerator are insulating. So this would correspond to the expansion of the gas or the demagnetization. You basically remove the material from the magnetic, magnetic field and the temperature will drop. So this is an area that uh, has long been known at low temperatures. Adiabatic demagnetization was how, for example, people first achieved uh, temperatures below one Kelvin. Joke at UC Berkeley, working with gadolinium sulfate, a paramagnet. Uh, but Pecharsky and Geschneider, working out of Ames lab, showed that, that you could apply this to room temperature processes, and, and there has been, since been quite a lot of interest. So uh, the figure of merit in these materials is the entropy change. So it's the entropy change associated with turning on and off a magnetic field. And this magnetic entropy change is conveniently estimated using a Maxwell transform of the magnetization. So you don't have to do a calorimetric measurement, a magnetization measurement suffices. So what you have to do is recognize that the, that, uh, the derivative delta S by delta H, where H is here, the magnetic field, not the enthalpy, delta S <coughs> by delta H taken isothermally is equal to delta M by delta T taken at constant field. So you take a lot of M versus T plots at different fields, take the, take the derivatives, and then you integrate along the field axis. So you, you then get traces like this on the right, which is the magnetic entropy change as a function of field and temperature. And this is just gadolinium metal, which is a pretty good magnetocaloric at room temperature. Uh, around its ferromagnetic temperature. So a group in, in the Netherlands of Eckersbrook <coughs> discovered uh, 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 about uh, a little over 10 years ago that there is a particular family of materials uh, that has this Fe2P structure. It's, an, it's a combination of iron, manganese, phosphorus, and silicon uh, that have tunable Curie temperatures in the range that you want. If you want to do room temperature refrigeration, these materials should be <coughs> their Curie temperature should be tunable in that range, as you, and as you see, they are. And these materials turn out to be extremely good magnetocalorics. And if you ask somebody to make you an inexpensive magnetic material, and you know they would be perfectly justified in choosing these four elements because they are about as cheap as and uh, about as you know <coughs> environmentally friendly as you could get. So, uh, uh, so uh, this material <coughs> was actually put together <coughs> by uh, BASF, a, uh, a startup in the US called Astronautics, 
and Hire, which is, of course, the world's largest white goods company in China. And they built this magnetocaloric wine cooler and demonstrated its, its utility. And I always laugh when I see this, because if you want to demonstrate ref refrigeration, a wine cooler is a good thing to build because you don't have to freeze water. You, know, you just have to re re reduce the temperature a little below the room temperature. Uh, the ideal temperature for wine is, you know, depending on, on the kind of wine, uh, is maybe around 10 or 12 degrees centigrade. And they advertise that it's, it's, it's a water-based heat exchanging fluid, it's energy efficient, and most importantly, it's fluorocarbon free, right? So the belief is that some of these materials could actually exceed no, uh, gas compression refrigeration in their efficiency. And I don't need to tell you, particularly as we are here in Ras al Khaimah, uh, well, the, the climate is pleasant now, but one can imagine that uh, a few months from now, it will be quite impossible to live here without air conditioning. And, and um, if you live in Phoenix, Arizona, which is the Ras al Khaimah of the US, um, air conditioning, uh, actually it's not because there's no, no ocean. Air conditioning uh, produces eight tons of carbon per year per home, it's, which is a lot of carbon. Okay, so uh, so magnetic cooling could be important. So the first thing that that we were challenged uh, uh, to do by by BSF actually was to make the the materials that uh, I just showed you, this iron, manganese, phosphorus, silicon materials, um, uh, more rapidly than than the synthesis. Uh, 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 that was reported by the original authors, which took sort of extensive cycles of grinding and annealing. So in my, in my lab, we like to use uh, domestic microwave ovens to do rapid reactions at high temperatures. So we found that we can actually make the materials uh, 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 face pure uh, in, uh, in very short periods of time, about 20 minutes in a microwave oven, followed by a quick anneal. So <coughs> after 20 minutes in the microwave oven, we already get the pure sample, but the magnetic properties to get to develop them properly, this annealing is, is rather important. And uh, I told you this, that these are pure samples. You may ask, uh, uh, they don't look pure, but that's because they, these are materials that undergo a first order magnetic transition. So what you're seeing here are both the high and low temperature phases across the transition. Oh. So uh, uh, these materials, these microwave ma made materials, are have properties that come uh, that compare as uh, uh, with the highest performing materials. The other thing that we developed uh, at this time was uh, was a method to speed up our measurements. So this is we've been hearing a little bit about AI and machine learning, and we often think about the utility of these in in, for example, advancing new materials. But we found uh, with 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 the help of our collaborator Professor Linda Petzold in the computer science department at UC Santa Barbara we found that we could actually use something called Gaussian process regression to greatly speed up uh, <coughs> the acquisition of our magnetic data. So, um, so uh, the example shown here, we've, actually, we've thrown away 98% of the data and we still get the, the entropy temperature traces that, uh, of the kind that we get with when we have all the data. So that we can really so this is a great example of where AIML methods can help us uh, when we ha where handle large data flows. So we had to build a database for magnetocalorics again. Uh, we had to build a database of magnetic materials uh, as a first step to, to finding out how to, how to make better magnetocalorics. So we did this, and again, we have a database and a website. And what we then started thinking about is how do we, how do we use a computational tool to screen for magnetocalorics. And the way we thought we should do this is we knew that the entire process is way too complex to model with a rapid DFT calculation. So we knew we had to come up with a proxy, something simple to calculate that would be indicative of the magnetocaloric properties. And what we knew at that time is most magnetocalorics have a structural transition associated with, the, with, the, uh, 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 with their Curie temperatures. So, uh, this is, for example, you know, synchron X-ray evidence on one of these compounds. So what we thought was, can we actually use the coupling of magnetism and structure to understand, uh, uh, to, as a simple proxy for screening magnetocalorics? We decided to do DFT calculations on the magnetic compounds with and without spin polarization. So we did a calculation in a world with 
magnetism and a wo in a world without magnetism, and we just compared the structures um, uh, in a slightly sophisticated way. I, I won't belabor you with the details, but if we do this, we come up with something that we call the, the magnetic uh, uh, deformation proxy, sigma m, uh, which we express in a percentage. And <coughs> we, we use this proxy then to try and distinguish magnetocaloric. So on the y-axis of these plots are the measured uh, entropy changes, and on the x-axis are these calculated magnetic deformation proxies. And you will agree it's a very simple def. It's about as simple a DFT calculation as you can do. It's just a structure relaxation with, or without, with magnetism and without magnetism, with spin polarization, without spin polarization. So um, you may think that this doesn't look like a great correlation, but we weren't expecting a particularly great correlation. We just wanted an indicator, because there existed none in the literature to tell you which materials are going to be good magnetocalorics. So this allowed, actually, uh, in our first attempt, we allowed us to, it, it confirmed that the high-performing magnetocalorics are indeed captured by this metric, and it also, al it also captured some of the low-performing magnetocalorics, which we had to measure because nobody actually reports low performers in the literature. So all the circles are, are new measurements of, of, of low-performing materials. And it allowed us to predict MNCOP with, 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 without optimization has a pretty decent magnetocaloric uh, 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 figure of merit, this delta SM. So uh, uh, this is uh, MN MNCOP, which we made measured. It's in, a, it's, it's in the titanium nickel silicon structure type, which is one of Claudia's favorite structure types. OK. So, uh, uh, so since we had a database of, of structures, we could then actually calculate the magnetic deformation index for all of them. <coughs> so this is not a very large database of, of magnet magnets. But then again, there aren't very many databases of magnetic materials. And this one uh, doesn't have any alloying, and this one doesn't have any rare earths. So, uh, so you can now go and pick a, a favorite temperature of operation. For example, if you want to make a magnetocaloric heat engine for waste heat recovery, you want high Curie temperature. If you want to do cryogenic refrigeration, you want low Curie, Curie temperature. So you can look at materials in the range of interests that have a high, uh, a high uh, 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 sigma m. So this is our screening tool contribution. Now, interestingly, uh, uh, CR3 TE4 is a material that we've We've made a few attempts to try and make. Turns out to be very hard to make. MNCOAS, we predicted to be a good magnetocaloric. But when we made it, we found it's not a ferromagnet. So it was wrongly reported as a ferromagnet. It's an antiferromagnet. And, and, and uh, we do capture in this, again, uh, as I said, compounds like that uh, with the Fe2P structure that I mentioned. So once we had this data, we tried to check whether any anything else uh, that we calculated could could also serve as a proxy for a good magnetocaloric, and in fact, we don't find anything else. So, what we calculate is actually the best uh, possible magnetocaloric. So, this was work led by Joshua Bokasli from my group, who's now a postdoc in the group of Claire Gray at the University of Cambridge. So, uh, here and here is the database, and again, we've actually provided this data to Citrine Informatics so the world can have it because there's quite a lot of d experimental data as well that's compiled. So one of the very interesting things, by the way, in going through this, is nothing correlates with the Curie temperature. The Curie temperature is one of the hardest things to predict using ML methods. <coughs> it's, very, it's a very interesting challenge to people interested in magnetism. You can, of course, <coughs> calculate a Curie temperature, but it's very elaborate, right? You have to calculate a lot, lot of J-couplings put it into some sort of a Monte Carlo simulation and then simulate it. So it's not a quick calculation if you want to calculate it ab initio. <coughs> so <coughs> uh, the other uh, uh, class of materials I want to talk about is are actually materials that don't require uh, 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 a proxy, because you can actually calculate them somewhat directly. It's not a simple calculation. It's not as simple as calculating a stability, but it's not very hard to calculate. And these are photovoltaics. This is work led by, by Doug Fabini, who finished uh, his PhD with me and then went to work with Betty uh, Lodge at, at Stuttgart. So Doug was interested in, in uh, had worked with us with, uh, on, on the perovskite photovoltaics and was interested in, 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 in asking, you know, what the perovskites took a long time to discover as effective photovoltaics. 
So Doug got curious about what else is out there that could potentially be a good photovoltaic material. And we have some guidelines in the literature on how to, how to uh, find good photovoltaics. For example, we know from, from work from uh, a long time back from uh, 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 what is called a detail balance uh, limit uh, for semiconductors that you have an optimal band gap. But uh, of course, uh, <coughs> as people like you and Zunga pointed out, knowing the band gap is not a predictor of photovoltaic performance. <coughs> you need to, for example, know also something about the optical transitions and so on. So <coughs> you and Zynga came up with what they call the spectroscopically limited <coughs> maximum efficiency. Uh, so you can, uh, the important message here is you can have something that has a good band gap, like in this particular example, it's copper yttrium tellurium 2, but it would actually not make a good photovoltaic, at least in thin film form, because it wouldn't have very good absorption. So we know that the optical absorption is important, but the other thing we figured out is you also want, when you create the electron hole pair in the photovoltaic, so light comes in, excites an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, so you've created this electron hole pair, you also want to be able to transport them. So you need semi-decent mobility in the valence band, the conduction band. And uh, a simple way to estimate the mobility is by looking at the curvature of the band structure and translating it in, into an effective mass. So what Doug did with his undergrad, Mitchell Corner, is he went into the database. Again, thank you old, old time crystallographers for populating it, solid state chemists and crystallographers. Looked at 46,000 compounds which were insulators. And uh, uh, so this was actually checked the materials project, but then uh, everything that was in the materials project but not in the ICSD was discarded because we were only interested in experimentally realized materials. Uh, checked that the, the initial screen of the band gap was okay, and then redid, uh, 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 started looking at effective masses and, and the optical transitions, and then for a smaller set, redid the band gap calculations and calculated the spectroscopically limited photovoltaic efficiency. So this gave us about 200 candidates. So, <coughs> so the way they did this, uh, particularly to get the, uh, get the curvatures, was automating parabolic fits to the, to the band structure. So this has since been uh, done by the materials project people themselves. So, uh, but at that time, it, w it wasn't uh, uh, a part of the suite. So, and then, of course, uh, we, uh, actually do the calculation of the, of the optical absorption. So these are the two components that go in. And, uh, and uh, uh, we also know that, that straight up DFT does a very bad job with band gaps, but these are all valence precise compounds. So it's relatively easy to correct for this using a method developed by Maria Chan and Gerd Seder. It's called the, a delta sol method. It's a, it's, a, it's a simple, you need three DFT calculations instead of one, three GGA calculations instead of one, and you can basically come up with something like, like, a, like an estimated scissor operator which opens up the band gap properly. So you see all these compounds shown as triangles. Uh, 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 you know, once you do the, the, this uh, delta sol calculation, you correct the band gap still there almost perfectly on experiment. So with this, uh, we can start looking at large numbers of uh, materials. So we have a lot of materials uh, uh, with, uh, re with relatively low effective masses and high F S SLMEs, the, the photovoltaic efficiencies. <clears throat> but when it comes to light holes, it becomes a much harder challenge. This is, this is rather interesting that, that the world of semiconductors has this asymmetry, that it's much easier to find something that's a good, uh, that has mobile electron carriers rather than mobile hole carriers. Uh, <clears throat> and this has to do with the fact that that anions are not very good at being forming dispersed bands, anion states, which are, which are the valence band states. So uh, anyway, this basically has allowed us to pull out literally every known photovoltaic material out there and a few unknown ones. Some of them you wouldn't want to make, but uh, some of them are promising to look at. And uh, you would ask, does it pull out the perovskites? Yes, it does. It pulls out the inorganic perovskites. Of course, there are no hybrids in the ICSD, so it doesn't pull them out. So it's, <coughs> it's interesting that compounds such as this scutterudite, iridium antimony-3, now nobody would want to put iridium antimony-3 on their roof, but uh, <coughs> these are compounds that actually other people have recently looked at as photovoltaic materials. So this is 
uh, an effective search. And we actually genuinely believe that you're unlikely to find a photovoltaic material from the ICSD, which is not in our list. So it's interesting to now, again, ask the kinds of questions like, what are the elements that are found in these materials? And it's, it should come as no surprise that a lot of the elements are uh, selenides and tellurides. Uh, <clears throat> and remember, this is completely unbiased search, right? Purely based on the electronic structure, known crystal structures, and calculated electronic structure. So lots of, uh, lots of uh, tellurides and uh, selenides. Curiously, quite a lot of compounds with sodium. OK, but, you, but again, if you were building a photovoltaic and you wanted to put it on your roof for 30 years, you probably don't want sodium in it. So, so you have to sort of start adding these additional levels of judgment uh, as you think about these compounds. So I think I should be stopping here. So thank you very much. I hope I've shown you a little bit some systematic ways to think about materials uh, screening for interesting properties. The session, uh, the, sp the speech is over now. Uh, we have uh, room and time for one or two questions. Okay. Very nice talk, Ram. Uh, so one comment I have is for the magnetic uh, systems, non-magnetic versus fully magnetic. It's possible to do partially magnetized state also in DFT, which may be, you can, yes, you like can constrain magnetization type calculation. So they may be closer to... Yeah, no, uh, we, we could. In fact, we have in other mm -hmm. examples, we've looked at things like, uh, like, like, uh, like uh, uh, is, it called, is, is it an SQR, spe specialized quasi, quasi random sequences for sure, the magnet? Sure. We, we have done those kinds of calculations. See. But remember, when we're doing high throughput, we do, that's already a little more complicated than we want no, to. No, so in, in non magnetic, you are setting it to zero. Yeah. You can set fixed magnetization to half the actual value. We also. could do that's that possible. too. That's, that, that's, yeah. that's, that's right. Yeah. That would be relatively so low cost. We've not easier. thought of doing yes, that, yeah. but we could. The second is for the magnetocaloric effect. Uh, what you seem to be getting at is a multi-caloric effect, actually. No, actually, uh, sorry, it's not. It's this confuses people, and there's, a, there's some subtlety. We, the structural transition is actually not good. I see. It's not I good see. for the magnetocaloric. But however, mm -hmm. the existence of the structural transition tells you that the magnet is going to talk to the external field. Does that make sense? OK, I, I'm not sure. I, we uh, can so, talk so, so, so it's yes. not the, the, so uh, the magnetostructural transition actually gives you an entropy change in the wrong direction. I see. But the existence of the magnetostructural transition tells you that the magnet's going to talk to the external field. It's a bit okay. uh, probably a little too detailed, but we can I discuss sure we'll this offline. <laughs> Ram, I, I have uh, I have one quick question here. Uh, do you do you do any? Is there a question? Yeah, Claudia. Yeah, Claudia, go ahead. I'm sorry. I did okay, so I have a, a small question and maybe some commentary. So you might mention. So you tried already a few of the magnetocaloric uh, materials and you proved that your methods work as well, right? Yes. And and I have small commentary because I think we just recently looked into Fe two phosphide. Uh, and we found very nice hard magnets yes. experimentally. I liked also the possibilities to maybe do this with uh, uh, the microwave. So it's maybe yeah. a good way to get yeah. higher amounts. Or so maybe talk. you can explain a little bit. Does it also provide the possibility to make bigger amounts of samples? Or? Well, you know, uh, uh, so, but yes. I mean, we can easily make like hundreds of milligrams in, in tens of minutes, right? So it's very easy to do like uh, like uh, like multiple. And again, I love re I love re reactions that undergraduates can do quickly before they go for lunch. Uh, so yes, uh, we could make large quantities, but we just use a, a hundred dollar domestic microwave oven. So that sort of limits us, but we could make large quantities. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we're going to to move on. Uh, thank yeah. you very much, Ron, for a nice presentation.